Hello, in this video, we're going to cover the unit four review for the college algebra class. And so I did already do this because there were 40 questions. And so they do take quite some time. You're definitely going to need to use at least two sessions to sit there unless you have lots of time. Um, it took me, I don't know, almost an hour to do everything so that I could write it all out and everything. Um, but again, that's because I know what to do and how to do it, and I don't need to go reference anything or look at notes. Um, so it might, I'm going to be a lot faster than the average student. So um, with that in mind, I did want to go ahead. I didn't want to make the video too long because it took me an hour just to do it, which means when I record it, it usually takes me at least double that time. And I definitely didn't want to have a two hour long video. Okay, so I'm, I'm going to cover my solutions, talk about what we what I did to get each solution, but um, I'll let you read through the problems and then I'll explain the uh, solution. So this problem number one says to solve the inequality and the inequality is x cubed minus 4x squared minus x plus 4 greater than 0. And so in order for us to solve a polynomial inequality, we must factor the polynomial, and it has to be equal to zero on one side of this inequality. Since I do already have it equal to, or not equal, but I already have zero on one side of the inequality, I just need to factor this. Since it's four terms, the only method I have for factoring four terms is grouping. So I looked at these first two terms and I decided that those two terms had an x squared in common. So I took the x squared out and that would left, left me with x minus four. Remember to double check that you factored x squared correctly, you would just distribute it back in. And if you distribute back in, you should get the original two terms, okay? If you do not, then that means that this step that you just wrote down is incorrect. Then I moved on to the second half of it. So I noticed that this one and this one had something in common. And so Really, they don't have anything in common. So I took out a one because I did not have any variables or any numbers in common. But because the first term is negative, I have to factor out that negative. So what happened is, is I ended up factoring out a negative one. And then what's in this parentheses should match what was in the other parentheses. And so I just write it in there and then I just double check that it's correct, okay? So is negative one times X negative X? Yes. Is negative one times negative four equal to positive four? Yes. So this does check out, which means that the second half is factored correctly, okay? Um, once I realized that this term, this whole term, and this whole term have the X minus four in common, I went ahead and took that out. Um, and then I got, uh, x minus four times this x squared and then this minus one. And so then I factored x squared minus one into x plus one and x minus one. So my key numbers are when this guy equals zero means x equals four. When this factor equals zero, it means that x equals negative one. And when this factor equals zero, it means that x equals positive one. So I plot, I, this is what the order I did it in. So I plotted the, first, the key numbers in there, and then I looked at the inequality, and it does not have a bar. So I put open dots on all of those points that I just plotted on my number line. Then I wrote the interval, because in this interval, before the first dot, it's negative infinity to negative 1 and a parentheses because it's an open dot. Then from negative 1 to 1, oh, that's an error. Negative 1 to 1, I... Um, From this dot to this dot is negative one to one. And then from this dot to this dot is one to four. And then from this dot going in that direction would be four to infinity. And since all the dots are open, that's why there's parentheses on all of these ends, okay? So then I picked a point in this interval, this interval here, I picked a number in there, negative five, and I plugged it into the original. So when I plugged it in, I got negative 216. That number is not greater than zero. So I put an X. That means that this section will not get shaded. Then in the next section between negative one and one, I picked zero. 
So when I plugged in zero, I got four and four is greater than zero. So that side did check out. So I shaded in between there. Then in the next interval between one and four, between this dot and this dot, I picked the number two. I plug two into my original inequality and I got negative six greater than zero. That is not true. So I put an X and I did not shade this region. Last one, I plugged in a five from four to infinity. I plugged in five into there and I got 24 greater than zero, which is true. So I shaded this region as well. Um, and then, so that means the two shaded regions are the part of my solution. So the first shaded region is negative one to one. And then the second shaded region is from four to infinity, both with um, parentheses. And that is what I typed in in the answer box over here in WebAssign. And then I did plot from negative one to one with parentheses and then four going that way with parentheses. Um, number two. So for number two, for number two, we have x, 6x cubed minus 9x squared less than zero. So I noticed that these two had a 3x squared in common. So I took the 3x squared out, and then that left me with 3 times 2 would give me 6, and x squared times x would give me x cubed. Then for this spot, I knew 3 times 3 was 9, 9, but since I already had the x squared out here, I didn't need any other variables in the side here. Okay, so then again, if you just double check, if you distribute and you get these two terms, then you did factor it correctly. Now I can get my key numbers. So when I set x squared equal to zero, I'm gonna take the square root of both sides and I get x equal to zero. When I take two x minus three equal to zero, I'm gonna add the three over, it'll become positive, and then I'll have to divide by two, so I'll get three over two. So my two key numbers are these. Now this inequality also did not have a bar at the bottom, so it's gonna be all parentheses. And it also means I'm gonna have an open dot at my key number zero and an open dot at my key number three halves. Once I have those open dots, that's when I start putting in my intervals. So in this interval, it's negative infinity to zero. In this interval, it's zero to three halves. And then in this interval, it's three halves to infinity. After I've done that, after I've made my number line, put my open dots and my intervals, then I pick a number in this section. So less than zero would be negative one. Between zero and three halves, I picked one. And then on this side from three halves to infinity, I picked two. So I plug this negative one in for X in the original and I got negative 15 is less than zero. This is true. Then I plugged in positive one in for X in the original and I got negative three is less than zero. That is also true. Then I plugged in two for all of the X's up there and I got 12 is less than zero and that is false, that is not true. So I did not shade this region, but since these two regions did check out, I did shade those, okay? Then that means that these two would be part of my answer and there is a hole here. So I do have to keep my intervals separated, okay? So I cannot combine them and say negative infinity to three halves because zero is not included in that in that batch, okay? Um, so I do have to keep it broken like this with the two separate intervals. So moving on to number three. So for number three, it wanted us to solve the inequality and the inequality was X minus three squared and then X plus four cubed greater than or equal to zero. So in this case, um, it's already factored and it already has the zero. So we don't need to do all of those steps. It's done for us. Um, we just need to get the key numbers. So the key number here is gonna be three. And then the key number here would be negative four, right? If you were to set each one of these factors equal to zero. So I marked negative four and three. And because this one did have an equal bar, we went ahead and put a solid dot on the negative four and the three. So what that ends up doing is creating the interval here, which is negative infinity to negative four. And then it's creating this interval here, which is from negative four to three. And then this interval here, which is three to infinity. And because we have solid dots this time, we do have our um, brackets on our endpoints here. So now 
we're going to pick our test values. So in this interval, I picked negative five. Between negative four and three, I picked zero. And then to the right of three, I picked five. I plugged those into the original, and I got negative 64 is greater than or equal to zero, which is not true, so I did not shade it. Then I plugged in zero up here, and I ended up with 576 greater than or equal to zero, which is true, so I shaded this middle region. Then I plugged in five here and computed it, and I got two nine, uh, 2,916, and that is greater than or equal to zero, so that section worked as well, so I shaded this one. Now, this dot is solid, so all of this is solid, so is the dot, and all of this is solid. What that means is essentially it's just solid all the way through seamlessly, okay? There's no hole that I have to hop over. So I'm, when I write my solution in intervals, it's going to be from this negative four all the way to positive infinity, okay? And so I did write that in as my interval here, and that is what I graphed down here below using a bracket. You could also use the solid dot. It's the same thing. So if I submit this new answer, it should still keep it green check on it. Um, if it changes it to a red X, that's because it doesn't accept the black dot. But it should. Yep, it's still green. I can see the green outline, but there's the little check. So I use the brackets just because I'm already using brackets up here. So I use the brackets over there. But you notice that on my paper, I do dots, right? So they're interchangeably. You just open dots or parentheses and solid dots are brackets, OK? Mm. OK, number four is this one here. It's a little bit shorter. So we have x to the fourth times x minus one less than or equal to zero. So if I were to set x to the fourth equal to zero, I would do the fourth root on both sides, right? And I would get zero. And if I set x minus one equal to zero, I would add one on both sides and I would get one, okay? So my, in, my key numbers are just zero and one. And since this problem does have a bar, that means they're gonna be solid dots. So then I picked a test number in this interval and it was negative one. I picked a number in this interval, it was 0.5. And I picked a number in this interval and it was two. I also, before I picked the um, key numbers, I also wrote my intervals. And since they were solid dots, I need to put brackets. Now, when I plugged in negative one into here, I got negative two less than or equal to zero, which is true. So I scribbled this side in. Um, when I plugged 0.5 into this, I got negative zero point something. And that is also less than zero. A negative number is always less than zero. And so this one checked out, so I shaded in that region. Then when I plugged in two, I got 16, and 16 is not less than zero. So this section did not check out, so I did not shade that section, okay? Um, and so then the only two I got were these two, but um, notice that this middle one is solid again, okay? So I am going from one all the way through without having to hop over the zero. So I don't need to separate the two intervals. It's just one seamless interval. It starts over here at negative infinity on the left and it stops at one on the right. And since it's solid, the one does have a bracket. Now, number five. So for number five, this one was to find the domain of the expression. So for this problem, we have to basically figure out when the, the denominator essentially can never equal zero when you have fractions, right? Because remember what a domain is. Domain is the set of X values that when you plug them in, you get a Y value back out. People who are not in the domain are the people who I plug in and then I get undefined, okay? And the only kind of numbers that I would get undefined or imaginary are in a fraction is when the denominator is zero. So essentially what I have to do is make sure that the denominator is never zero. And so to do that, what you do is you find out what numbers would make the denominator zero. And then you say your domain is everybody but those guys, okay? So I definitely need to figure out what is making my denominator zero. Now, what symbol you put here in the middle doesn't really matter. Whether you put a does not equal or you put an equal, it really doesn't matter, okay? It's the concept that you have to understand. You're just trying to find those numbers 
to omit from the domain. Your domain is all the numbers except for those two that make, or one, it just depends, whatever the numbers are that make that denominator zero, okay? You're trying to take those out of the domain. Otherwise, the domain would have been all real numbers, period, but it's not. You gotta make sure that there's no numbers that will make the denominator zero. So if you set it equal to zero, you can find out what makes it equal to zero. Or if you say that it cannot equal zero and then solve that with a not equal symbol, it doesn't make a difference, okay? So I solved it by factoring, but I know that a lot of you like to do the quadratic formula. So I, you could do it either way. You can do it by factoring or you can do it by the quadratic formula. It's up to you. Point is, is you get the same numbers regardless, negative two and negative seven. Negative two and negative seven are the two numbers that if I plug them into that fraction, I will get undefined, okay? And since I plugged in a number, but I didn't get a number back, that means that those two numbers are not in your domain. So logically, the statement that they have in there is that your domain is all real numbers as long as or such that um, X is not negative two or negative seven. Okay, and so that is the option that I selected over here, and that is the statement that we made down here at the bottom. So for number six, it says, um, it says write the rational expression in simplest form. So I have 10 X squared over four X. Now, a lot of people can just simplify it here. They'll say an X cancels, but I'll have one left on top. And then 10 and four can both be simplified by two. So this guy divided by two is five and this guy divided by two is two. However, if you are not doing that, you can figure out, well, what do they both have in common? Well, this one can be divided by two and an X, and this one can also be divided by two and an X. And so what you can do is break up the 10 X squared into two X times whatever else to make 10 X squared. Then multiply the, get the four X to be two X times whatever else you need to get four X, okay? So in this instance, two X times five X gave me 10 X squared and two X times two gave me four. Well, these common factors that they share cancel and I still get the 5x over 2 the same, okay? Um, now let's go to number 7. Here we have 9y plus 15y squared over 10y plus 6. So we definitely need to factor what they have in common. And honestly, I should have rearranged this first. So... Notice that it's not in the correct order. So what I should have done is I should have rearranged this to 5y squared plus 9y, okay? And at the bottom, they were in the proper order, so I went ahead and factored out the common factor, which was a two. Both of these could be divided by two, so I factored out the common factor. In the numerator though, both of the numbers can be divided by three, and both of them share at least one y. So I factored out a three y. And just to make sure that we factored this correctly, make sure that when you distribute it, you do get the two original, okay? Same thing when you factor this one. Make sure that when you distribute this three Y that you do get these two terms. That's how you know you factored it correctly. Now I know that both are factored correctly. These two factors are the same, so they do cancel or reduce. And that leaves me with just the three Y over two. Now for number eight, Number eight was x squared minus 2x minus 3 over 18 minus 3x minus x squared. So the bottom one was not in order, so I rearranged it into negative x squared minus 3x plus 18. The top was fine, so I left it alone. But I noticed I had a negative coefficient in the very front, and we learned in the factoring section at the very beginning of the semester that anytime you have a negative in the front, you have to factor that out. So then that makes the x squared turn positive, the 3x turn positive, and the 18 turn negative. Because remember, when I distribute this, I need to get these same signs, okay? I did nothing to the top because there was nothing to do. But now that you have everybody all in order and you got this GCF factored out, now it's time to factor those trinomials. So I factored the top trinomial into x minus 3 and x plus 1. And I factored the bottom polynomial into x minus three and x plus six. Now, how you get those factors is completely up to you, okay? Y'all know how to um, use the quadratic formula. 
And you know now that whatever solutions you get in that quadratic formula, you can just use the opposite signs and put them in factors, right? So you can reduce, simplify these things by doing the quadratic formula and finding out, oh, my quadratic formula tells me that when I plug in all of these numbers, I end up with negative one and positive three. So that means that I'm gonna have X minus, I mean, X plus one is a factor and X minus three is a factor, the opposite signs. Or here, if you wanna do the quadratic formula with what's in the parentheses, because the negative one will come down, you'll figure out that the quadratic formula leads to you to a positive three and a negative six, which means that X minus three and X plus six are your factors, okay? But you definitely need to factor it, okay? Once you have it factored, you'll notice that these two factors are the same. So those reduce, you end up with X plus one on the top and X plus six at the bottom. And we all know that formally, we do not like negatives at the bottom. So if you have this negative one factor, you basically just scoot the negative up to the front. And so it becomes a negative fraction, X plus one over X plus six. Now for number nine, number nine was X squared minus nine divided by eight divided by three minus X over four X plus 12. So the first thing I did was the keep change flip. And when I flip this over, I also wrote these terms in the right order. So keep first fraction the same, it stays identical. Change this to a multiplication and then flip this fraction over. But instead of positive three minus X, I wrote negative X plus three. Then I factored the top, which was X plus three, X minus three. Eight was just eight. Here I factored out a four, I got four times X plus three. And here I factored out that negative one and I got X minus three. I noticed that the X minus threes are the same and four and eight could reduce by four. So four divided by four is one, eight divided by four is two. So what I have left is X plus three times, or this it's X plus three times one times X plus three. I just wrote them in that order because it doesn't matter what order. I just like monomials in the front. Then two times negative one is negative two. Again, with the negative, we like it in the side, in the front. So we got it there. We don't need to have this one coefficient. And then X three times X three is just X three, X plus three cubed, squared, sorry. Two of them means squared. And so I did enter that into my um, box here and it was marked correct. Now, number 10 was a little bit weird. I did the problem on paper first, and then I came over here to look at this. So the first thing I did was um, this subtraction. And so the first thing I noticed was that this was not in descending order. So I rewrote it into negative X plus 10. Everything else stayed exactly the same. I'm just changing the bottom here in the second fraction. Then I noticed because the front guy is negative, I have to factor out a negative one. So when I did, the X became positive and the 10 became negative. And then I noticed that this guy would eventually, right, this one would eventually move into a negative right here. But when you have a negative and a double negative, it turns it to plus, okay? And because this came up, it's no longer there. So all I have in this denominator is just the X minus 10. Then I know that if I have two denominators that are the same, I can just combine the numerators together over that same denominator. And so then I came over here and I clicked, you know, to start the issue. And I noticed that they had the original problem and then the first fraction stayed the same and it had a minus and it had the same top. And all it looks like was that they factored out a negative one. So it looks like they were doing this step right here and so in that parentheses, I just typed in the X minus 10, okay? And it turned out to be correct. Then I noticed that when I combined the double negatives, I got a plus sign, but there's no longer a little negative down here in the fraction. So it was just four over just the X minus 10. And then since the both of them had the X minus 10, I knew I could combine the two tops, five X plus four in the numerator and then keep that same denominator. And sure enough, that's exactly what they wanted me to do, okay? So for number 11, we have three fractions to um, combine. And so, sorry. 
So for the first two, you have to go from left to right when you're adding or subtracting. So we're gonna combine these two. So what we did was we used that basic uh, rule that says I do negative seven times this denominator and then the same symbol plus, and then 11 times this denominator. And then the two denominators multiplied together. So I distributed my negative seven and I got negative seven X squared minus seven. And these two multiplied is just 11 X. I also factored this denominator. They have an X in common, which gave me X squared plus one. And since they both have the same denominator here, I went ahead and wrote that numerator up there with the other numerators and then just kept it all over one of those denominators. Then I noticed that the negative seven and the positive seven canceled. So I got negative seven X squared plus 11 X. Um, and then I noticed that these guys had a common X. So I factored that out and they canceled. And then I ended up with negative seven X plus 11 over X squared plus one. Also, you could, if it really bothers you that that has a negative in the front, you could also factor out that negative. And then if you're a real stickler and want the negative in the front, you can have it like that too. And this is equivalent to my answer that I typed in the computer. I'll even prove that it's correct. That's the same thing. So if I put this negative in the front, I have to change this 11 to minus, right? So I had this in there originally, and now I'm typing in this one, but notice there's a minus now up there. And if I submit it, it should still be a green check. Watch it be wrong, right? <laughs> nope, it's still a green check. Okay, so either one, this one or this one, it's the same thing, they're both correct. Okay, now number 12 is to simplify the complex fraction. So the first thing to do is to take this top and write it top divided by bottom. So I wrote exactly that, the whole top divided by the whole bottom. Then I use my division rule, which was to keep the fraction, first fraction the same, change this to multiplication and then flip the second fraction over. So when I did that, all I did was factor this numerator and then expand this into x minus four times the second x minus four, literally the definition of a square, right? And so then I noticed that the x's would cancel, x minus fours would cancel, and I was left with x plus four on top and x minus four at the bottom. And so I typed that in there and it was accepted. So 13, 14, and 15 all seem to be solving equations. So for number 13, I had 30 over X plus two equal to 12 over X plus six or minus 12 over X plus six equal to one. So the common denominator that I used was just to multiply these two together. And so the common denominator I used was X plus two and X plus six. So I multiplied that times every single fraction or term. So this fraction times that minus the 12 fraction times this equal to the one times that. Then here a factor cancels and I'm left with 30 times X plus six. Here a factor cancels and I'm left with minus 12 times X plus two. And then here, if you're multiplying by one, you don't really need to write the one. So I just have X plus two times X plus six. So I foiled out the third or distributed the 30, distributed the negative 12, foiled all of this out and then I combine my like terms on the left side. I combine my like terms on the right hand side. I noticed I had an X squared. So I went ahead and moved these two terms over to the other side. And when I did, I ended up with zero equal to X squared minus 10 X minus 144. I went ahead and factored it, but you could have also done the quadratic formula and you still would have got these two answers, okay? So however you wanna solve that, whether you wanna use quadratic formula or you wanna factor it and do it this way. Um, and each way is, is perfectly okay. They're both two methods to do the same thing, okay? Um, so for number 14, we have four minus 11 over X. Oh, and I didn't mention, but you always wanna make sure that your solutions do not make any of your denominators zero, right? Because otherwise those are not in the domain, which means they can't be answers. So 18 does not make, it makes this denominator 20 and it would make this denominator 24, but that's not zero. So 18 is good. Negative eight, that would make this negative six. It would make this negative two. Fine. It's okay if it's a negative denominator. It just can't be zero. Okay. 
So these two are both good solutions. Now moving on to number 14. So for number 14, I noticed that we have these two denominators. So the common denominator that I used was x times x squared, which was x cubed. And I multiplied each term by that x cubed. So four times x cubed, the 11 over x times x cubed, the three over x squared times x cubed, and even a zero times x cubed. Now here, I just ended up with four x cubed. Here, one of the x's cancels, so I have 11 times x squared, which is why I have minus 11 x squared here. And then here we have um, two of the x's will cancel, leaving me with just one. And so that's why I have minus three times x here. And then zero times anything we already know is zero. So these terms do have an x in common. So I factored out my x. Um, and then I got 4x squared minus 11x minus 3. And so then I factored this. Again, if you're not great at factoring, use your quadratic formula. You can set this x equal to 0, and you'll still get this f factor. And then if you set this equal to 0, you could do the quadratic formula, and you'll still get negative 1 over 4 and positive 3. But if you're good at factoring, it's a lot faster than doing the quadratic formula, OK? Regardless, the um, solutions are one could be any of these three. It could be all three. It could be two of the three. It could be one of the three. Or it could be none of the three. And then I have no solution, OK? You have to make sure that they don't make your denominator 0 in the original. So 0 does make both of these denominators 0. So 0 is not a solution. Um, but negative one fourth, it would make this denominator negative one fourth, and it would make this denominator positive one sixteenth. As weird as that is as a denominator, it doesn't matter as long as it's not zero. This is a perfectly okay solution. Three, if I plug in three, I'm going to have three or nine, not zero. So that's perfectly okay as well. So my only two solutions that I have are the negative one fourth and the three. And those did check out in the web assignment. Okay, number 15 is where we have x plus 1 over 11 minus x plus 1 over x plus 2, or x plus 10, I'm sorry, equal to 0. So the common denominator I used here was 11 times x plus 10. And so then I multiply 11 times x plus 10 to all three, right? To this fraction, this fraction, and the 0, okay? Now here, the 11s cancel, so I have this numerator, the whole numerator, times x plus 10. I have my minus sign, and then I have this whole numerator, that's why there's parentheses, times just the 11, because the x plus 10 is canceled. And then 0 times anything is just 0. So I like to write my monomials in the front. So I wrote it in the front there. It goes between the sign and then the term. So it's negative 11 times x plus 1. So I foiled these out, and then eventually I did distribute my negative 11. And then I combined all of my like terms and I ended up with x squared minus one equal to zero. I added one to the other side. I took the square root on both sides, which gives me plus or minus, but the square root of one is just one. So I ended up with the two numbers, one and negative one. Now, when I plug in one here, I get 11 as a denominator. That's cool. When I plug in negative one in here, I get nine as a denominator. That's also okay. So both of these are our solutions. Okay, now for this problem, um, this one said, working together, two people can complete a task in eight hours. So I wrote together, they could do it in eight hours. Working alone, one person takes two hours longer. To me, that meant the slower person. And if it's two hours longer, that means I'm going to add two hours to the other person's time, okay? Um, and so then I don't know how fast this other person is going, and that's why I put X. But I also made sure to label what x is. x is the speed of the faster person. OK? Um, and so then remember the formula. It's 1 over the first guy's time plus the second guy's time should equal 1 over the time together. All work problems have this formula. So I wrote 1 over the first person, meaning the fastest person, right? And then the slower one. 
and then one over his speed, right? It's gonna be two, two uh, hours slower. And then it's gonna be one over the time together, which was eight. So for here, the common denominator I used was, uh, I multiplied the monomials together and then times this binomial. And I multiplied that for this fraction, this fraction, and this fraction. Now here the X is canceled, one times eight is eight and the two plus X came down. Here, one times eight X is eight X, but this is canceled. So all I have is the eight X equal sign, eight and eight canceled, one times X was just X and I still have the two plus X. Now here I distributed my eight and here I distributed my X. I did have an X squared term here. So I went ahead and moved all three of these terms over. So I kept this, kept this, and then just wrote minus 16, minus eight X, minus eight X. After combining my like terms, I got X squared minus 14 X minus 16. Then I did, I tried factoring, but when I tried to factor, I did not get any factors of 16 that would give me 14 when I added or subtracted. So that's why I went ahead and did quadratic formula. So it's negative of B plus or minus B squared minus four times A times C all over two times A. So this became positive 14. This in the inside was 260. When I typed this in my calculator, it gave me two squared to 65. I split the fraction 14 over two and this term over two. And the 14 over two reduces to seven. These reduce to just square root of 65. And so then I typed in seven plus the square root of 65 and got 15.1. And I rounded to the first decimal place because it did tell me to do that. In parentheses, it says round your answers to one decimal place. And then when I did seven minus the square root of 65, I got negative 1.1. So obviously X is the 15.5, but remember up here, X by itself was the faster person. So the faster person takes 15.1 hours, but the slower person takes two hours longer. So I added two to that and I got 17.1. But I noticed over here, they have slower person on top. So I had to make sure I put the 17.1 on top. And then the bottom box was the faster person. And so that's where the 15.1 should go. I did enter it in backwards the first time until I realized the labels were the other way around on the computer. Okay, number 17. So for number 17, this one says, I don't know why I keep yawning. It's because I just ate and now my body's like, okay, nap time. <laughs> Sorry. Um, it says a family drives 756 miles to a vacation lodge. On the return trip, it takes the family one and a half hours longer traveling at an average speed that is seven miles per hour slower to drive the same distance. Determine the average speed on the way to the lodge, okay? So I used, I used subscripts to help me, but VT means on vacay to the lodge. Okay, so that's what it means. It means to the lodge is VT. And then RT meant um, return trip. So I have two situations that are happening. I, I know I need to figure out what's going on on the way over there, right? And then what's coming on on the way back. So to keep the difference, you know, they both have distance, rate, and time, but to keep them separated in my mind, which distance I'm talking about, the return trip or the original trip, um, I used these subscripts, okay? So VT is on the way over there and then RT is the return. So it didn't matter whether I was going on the way or returning, my distance for both of those trips would have been 756 miles. Now, they did tell me that on my return trip that I did take 1.5 hours slower or longer. So that's why I'm adding 1.5 hours to the other trip, right? On the way over there, I don't know how long it took me to go. This tells me uh, hours of um, trip to the lodge. That's what that number represents, okay? And then this one represents the hours on the, the return trip.
Okay. And so I do know that it's 1.5 hours longer than that, which is why I'm adding it. Okay. Now they also told me that I, my average speed was seven miles slower. So on my return trip, my, my was slower. So I subtracted seven from the original speed. Okay. So this is the speed to lodge. And then this one's the return speed. Okay, so we've got two different numbers there. Now, what it's asking me to find is it says determine the average speed on the way to the lodge. So since they're wanting to know the uh, average speed on the way to the lodge, they're asking me for SV, okay? So I just need to solve for X. I don't wanna have to do any extra little pieces. So I let X be the unknown that I'm trying to find. So I said, okay, well then if that's what I'm trying to find, I'm gonna let that equal X. And the only other unknown, so I know something about this, right? It gives me a relationship and now I'm gonna call that guy X. And I also know something about this relationship, but what I don't know is what this value is, okay? And I don't know what his value is either, so that's why I let him equal X. But since I don't know what this value is, and I know those are not the same thing, I mean, for one, this is speed and this is time, right? So I can't choose the same letter to represent it. So I chose a different letter, I chose Y, okay? Um, so when I'm doing all my replacements, I do know that the distance for both of these is still 756. I know that the time for that return trip is 1.5 um, plus the Y value. And I know that the speed of the return trip is gonna be X minus seven. Now here's what's going on. I'm basically doing this formula, distance equals speed times time for both of them, okay? So the distance for the, the trip to the lodge, the distance is 756. My speed to the lodge, my speed to the lodge is X. So that I to the X here. The time that it takes me going to the lodge is Y. So that's why I have Y here, okay? Now I'm talking about the return trip. I know that the distance is the same for the return trip. So that's also 756, but my speed should be slower. So that's the X minus seven representation. And then I know that my um, time was 1.5 slower than, or fat, uh, longer than the other trips. So that's the 1.5 Y. Now we do need to use substitution method because we essentially have two equations because we have two variables. So the best way to solve um, systems that have that, where you have two equations and two variables, is to uh, isolate one of those variables and then basically substitute it into the other one, okay? So what I did was I divided both sides by x, okay? And I did that so that my other equation would have a bunch of x's in it, okay? So I got y by itself, and now I know what to use. Instead of y, I will use this fraction. So coming over to this equation, instead of using that y, I'm going to use what the y is equivalent to, which was 756 over x. And then from here, now everything is all in one variable, so I can solve for that one variable. So I went ahead and I distributed my x, and I got these two terms, um, and then I distributed this guy, and I ended up with these two terms. And then I noticed that I still had a fraction after everything was said and done. So I multiplied each term by an X and that canceled the X here, giving me a constant. Then I noticed that I had an X squared. So I moved this term over and it just wiped this one out. So I ended up with zero equal to 1.5 X squared minus 10.5 X minus 52.92. Then I did the quadratic formula because I do not know how to factor when there's decimals involved or fractions. I'm just not great at it, so I don't bother. Um, so I went ahead and did the quadratic formula. So negative of B plus or minus B squared minus four times A times C all over two times A. Then I got positive 10.5. This all was this huge number. The denominator is three. Then I did the square root of that number and I got 178.5. This was like a weird moment. My hand like spasmed and just went pew. And I meant to draw the line, you know, straighter, but my hand just went up, I don't know, whatever. It does that sometimes. Um, so I did 10.5 plus this number over three and I got 63. 
Then I did 10.5 minus 178.5 and divided that by three and I got negative 56. Now remember, X was a speed, right? X was the speed. It doesn't make sense for speed to be negative, which is why I crossed this one out, okay? Um, so my speed is going to be 63. And that's exactly what I was asked to find with SVT. And that's exactly what X represented. And that's exactly what I found. So I'm done. The answer there is 63 miles per hour. Okay, here we have um, x squared minus four over x less than zero. And so let's see. Yes, okay. So we do need to factor both the numerator and the denominator when doing rational inequalities. So I factored this into x plus two and x minus two, and the bottom is just a monomial, so it cannot be factored. So I set each of these equal to zero. So this one equal to zero gives me x equal to negative two. This factor equal to zero gives me x equal positive two, and this factor equal to zero gives me just x equal to zero. Now, because there's no bar under here, both of these two would get open dots. So it's not a degree symbol, it's just a representation of what kind of dot it's gonna get, okay? So the two that came from the numerator would get the symbol according to this uh, symbol in the middle. So they get their uh, dots or solid dots based on this inequality symbol. And since it does not have a bar, those two from the top get open dots. Anything from the bottom automatically gets an open dot, okay? always. So that means that there will be an open dot at negative two, an open dot at zero, and an open dot at positive two. So that's four sections that I need to write intervals for. So from negative infinity to negative two, that first open dot, which is here, and since it's an open dot, it's a parenthesis. Then from negative two with a parenthesis all the way to the next open dot, so it's zero with the parenthesis, then zero with the parentheses all the way to the other dot, which is a two with parentheses, and then two with parentheses all the way to the right, which would be positive infinity. Then in between each section, I'm gonna pick a number. In here, I picked negative three. In between negative two and zero, I picked negative one. In between these two, I picked one. And then over here to the right, I picked positive three. I plugged negative three into this original inequality and got negative five over three less than zero. That's true, negatives are less than zero. When I plugged in negative one up here at the top, I got three is less than zero, which is not true. When I plugged in positive one in the top, I got negative three is less than zero, which is not true. And then when I plugged in positive three, I got five thirds less than zero, which is not true. So the only two sections that came out true were these two, so I shaded those and then I wrote the solution, this interval union with this interval. Okay, so for number 19, we have x plus 14 over x plus two, greater than or equal to three. But for inequalities, we have to have zero on one side. So I minus three on, on both sides and I ended up with this inequality then you do have the difference of two fractions. You can think of this as three over one. So it's uh, x plus 14 times this one, and then minus three times this denominator all over the two denominators multiplied together. So when I distribute the one, I get x plus 14. When I distribute the negative three, I get negative three x minus six. Um, and then one times anything is that same thing. Here, combine my like terms. And then I factored out a negative two. They both had a two in common and the front number is negative. So I factored out a negative two and I got X minus four. Um, these do not cancel. So I'm just gonna go from here and get my key numbers. Um, my key number for the top is four. My key number for the bottom is negative two. Because the inequality symbol has a bar, the four that came from the top will have a solid dot. But anything that comes from the bottom should automatically have an open dot. So I drew my number line, marked negative two with an open dot, positive four with a closed dot, and that created these three sections. And so I wrote the intervals for each of those three sections. I picked a test number in each interval, plugged them into the original. So I plugged in my numbers into this and then compared them to three. 
So when I plugged in this number, I got negative 11. That's not greater than or equal to three. When I plugged in zero, I got seven. That is not greater than or equal, or that is greater than or equal to three. So this section is shaded. And then when I plugged in five, I got 19 over seven greater than or equal to three. I put this in decimal form and it was 2 point something or 2.7 something. So that is not greater than three. So this section did not work as well. So the only section that worked was the negative two to four. Um, for number 20, we have this inequality. Again, I have to have zero on one side. So I subtracted that fraction over. I went ahead and combined the two fractions into one following that basic rule. Um, distributing the one and distributing the negative eight, we arrived at this line. Combining the like terms, we ended up with this. Factoring out the negative and the common factor of five, I ended up with x minus four, which did not cancel with any of these. So uh, my key number from the top is four. Since there's a bar, it will be a solid dot. All key numbers coming from the denominator will always have open dots, regardless of what symbols here in the inequality. So negative four thirds has an open dot, two has an open dot, four has a closed dot. That creates this interval. And this interval. And this interval. Oh, the four has brackets because of the closed dot. And so then when we tested each one of these numbers, again, we always test it into the original. So I plugged the number in here and I plugged the number in there and then compared the two results. So when I plugged in negative two, I got these values. That is false. When I plugged in zero, I got these values. That is true. When I plugged in three, I got these values. This is false. And when I plugged in five, I got these values, which is also true. So that means that this section came out true and this section came out true. So my solution is going to be this interval and this interval. And I did type those in the number 20 and wrote graph the um, image there. Now for 21 through 25, they are all the same thing. So these are gonna go pretty quick, but it is this basic um, in behavior. So we know if we have a positive leading coefficient and an even exponent, both ends go up. If you have a negative leading coefficient and an even exponent, both ends go down. If you have a positive leading coefficient, but an odd exponent, um, they're gonna look like this, kind of like an X cubed. And if it's the opposite, this basically flips over, okay? So for 21, this was my function here. I got to point out the leading term. The leading term is the term with the highest exponent. So I circled my leading term. And then I noticed that I had a positive co leading coefficient and it had an odd exponent. So that's going to follow this in behavior according to this chart. So this falls to the left and rises to the right, which is what I selected over on the uh, assignment. Now for 22, we have this function, and this is the term with the highest exponent. It has a positive leading coefficient, an even exponent, so it has this behavior, which rises on both the left and the right. Looking at number 23, this is the term with the highest exponent, so I circled it. It has a negative coefficient with an even exponent, which means it has this kind of behavior, which falls on the left and falls on the right. So it's falling on both ends, and that's what I selected here. Um, for 24, we have this function. Um, this is the term with the highest exponent. It has a negative coefficient and an odd exponent. So it has behavior like this, which rises to the left and falls to the right. So I'm sorry, those were one through 24. So for 25, it asks us to consider the following function, um, x squared minus 25, which I factored into x plus five and x minus five. And setting each one of these factors equal to zero gives me a negative five, zero, and a positive five, zero. And since the exponents here are invisible ones, the multiplicity of each one is one. Now, both of those multiplicity ones, one is odd, and so is this one is odd. Um, my turning points is going to be two minus one because the degree of the function is two. So the degree minus one is the number of turning, max turning points. Um, and then I just went ahead and found the y-intercept just so I could figure out what graph it was going to be. But looking at that uh, original, I know that it's a positive x to the even, so both ends should be going up. And so the only graph that really follows that correct in behavior is this one in the top right. Um, number 26. So for number 26, we have this function. 
Um, if I look at the leading term, that's a positive x to the odd, which means it's going to have this in behavior. Um, just looking at the graphs, it looks like all of them have that in behavior, so it's not going to help us uh, dump, uh, get it down. Um, but I did notice that all of these had a 7x in common, so I factored out the 7x. I could not factor this, so I used the quadratic formula to come up with the two other numbers. So we ended up with 2 plus square root of 3, which was this number as a decimal, and 2 minus the square root of 3, which is this number as a decimal. Each of these is just with the multiplicity 1, okay? And 1 is odd, so their multiplicity for both of them is odd. Now, this 7x equal to 0 gave me my other 0, and so x equals 0, 0 is my quote unquote 0, right? Um, but that has a multiplicity of 1 because its exponent is also a 1, okay? And 1 is odd. So all three of them are going to have odd multiplicity. But you have 1, 0 is the number 0, 1, 0 is 2 plus square root of 3, the other 0 is 2 minus square root of 3. The number of turning points would come from the degree. The degree is 3, so 3 minus 1 is 2 turning points max. Um, and so then let's see which of these graphs have these zeros or x-intercepts. So we want to have 0, 3.73, and 0.27. So it's this graph over here. This is the only graph that seems to have um, 0, some other decimal 0 to come back down, and then the 3.73 something. Okay, So this is our um, option. So 27 is this function. And so I did factor out the common x squared. I was able to factor this. So I have x plus 3 and x plus 4. So setting this one equal to 0, I get 0, but the exponent is 2, so the multiplicity is 2. Here I get negative 3, but the multiplicity is 1. Here I get positive 4, but the multiplicity is positive is 1. 1 is odd, 1 is odd, and 2 is even. So if you put these on a number line, this is the smallest, this is the one in the middle, and this is the largest. So that was how I was able to figure out which one to type in here. So all the numbers are 0, negative 3, and 4. But then the smallest one has odd multiplicity, the middle one has even, and then the largest number has odd multiplicity. If I'm finding the number of turning points, it's going to be that degree minus 1. So that's three turning points. And then this is a positive x to the fourth, so I know it's going to have this in behavior, but it looks like all of the graphs have that in behavior. But there's only one that has these three x intercepts. So this one has zero, negative three, and positive four. This one has the opposite signs, um, and this also has not is not right. This one has the same zeros, but remember this is even, so it's only going to touch the zero. And this is odd and odd, so it's going to cross through the negative 3 and the 4. And this is the only graph that does that. It crosses through negative 3, touches the 0, and crosses through 4. Whereas this one touches the negative 3. But the negative 3 was not the 0 with the even multiplicity. So this has got to be our graph at the bottom right. Number 28. So for number 28, we had this function. I factored out a common t. I got t to the fourth minus 14t squared plus 49. I factored this into t squared minus 7, t squared minus 7. You could FOIL that out to check that it's correct. And then this is a difference of squares, even though this is not a perfect square. So we just did t minus square root of 7, t plus square root of 7. And since this factor is the exact same thing, it's another t minus square root of 7, t plus square root of 7. So there's really two of these together the same and two of those together the same. So if I set this one equal to 0, I get the 0 of 0 with multiplicity of 1 because the exponent is 1. When I set this factor equal to 0, I get t equal to square root of 7 and the multiplicity is 2. When I set this factor equal to 0, I get t equal to negative square root of 7, and again with a multiplicity of 2, okay? Now, this is 2.6 about, this is about negative 2.6. If I put these in order on a number line, this number is the smallest, 0 is in the middle, and then square root of 7 is the largest number. So when it came to putting in my multiplicity, I had to put even first, then odd, then even. Now my... Uh, 
degree here was five. So five minus one is four. That's gonna be the number of maximum turning points. Um, and then the in behavior is a positive, but an odd exponent. So it has this in behavior. So I plotted the negative seven, the zero and the seven. And I'm starting down here according to my in behavior. And since the square, this one had even exponent, I knew I needed to just touch it, right? The negative square root of seven had even. Then I knew that this one had odd, so I had to go through there. So that means I had to go back up to get through there. And then this one is even, so I'm just gonna touch it. So I gotta go back down to get to it and then go up. And so the graph that closely resembles my graph is this one here. These two were the only with the ones with the correct in behavior, but um, this one's got the only one that's doing the correct thing. It's only touching and touching this, whereas these are all going through as if all the multiplicities were odd. Okay, so that's enough graphing polynomials for now. Let's go ahead and get to the next thing, which is division. So it says to divide this using synthetic division. So since I'm dividing by a factor of x plus eight, the k value that I use is actually a negative eight. So I bring down the six, multiply these, combine those, I get six, multiply those, get negative 48, combine these, we get negative four, multiply those, we get 32, and then combine these, we get zero. Always box your last value because that is your remainder. From the rest of it, you're gonna go constants, x's, and x squareds. And if there were more entries, I would be doing x cubed, x to the fourth, and so forth. So this essentially quotient turns into six x squared plus six x minus four. Now for number 30, it's the same thing, but notice that I'm dividing by a factor of x minus three. So that means my k value should be just positive three. And I brought in all my coefficients, nobody is missing and they're already all in order. Brought down the first number, multiplied, combined, multiplied, combined, multiplied, and then combined. And this is my remainder. So this is my constant, my x's and my x squareds. So we ended up with 6x squared plus 25x plus 74 plus my remainder over my divisor. This is what I was dividing by, so that is the divisor here. Now 31. Um, 31 asks us to do to write it in a certain form, okay? So I did use the k value. They didn't give it to me as a factor. They gave me just straight up k equals 4. So I put four here and then the coefficients, one, negative one, negative 18, 17. First one down, multiply, then combine, then multiply, result goes here, combine, multiply, the result goes here, combine, and the last one is your remainder. This is your constants, this is your x's, and this is your x squareds. So this becomes one x squared plus three x minus six, but with a remainder of negative seven. And if, since they want me to write it in this form, it's got to be x minus my k value, which was 4, then my quotient, which was x squared plus 3x minus 7, plus the remainder. But plus negative 7 is the same as saying minus 7. And then the bottom says just to demonstrate that f of k equals r. So I did f of 4. I plugged in the 4 into the original function, and I evaluated it, and I got negative 7. So I did verify that that's what it equals, and I just typed in the remainder negative 7. Now, number 32 asks us to consider the following. It wants us to list all of the possible rational zeros. So we have to get the factors of the constant in the numerator and the factors of the leading coefficient in the bottom. So the factors of four are one, two, and four, and the factors of one is just one. So every combination of these would be just one, two, and four. Of course, all the sign variations. So I typed in positives one, two, and four, and then negatives one, two, and four. Now to figure out which ones are actual zeros, I went ahead and plugged every single one of those numbers into the function. And the three that gave us zero are the actual quote unquote zeros. And since it's a cubed function, I need to have three zeros and I found all three doing this way. So then I know that my zeros are, um, are negative one, two, and negative two. So the factors became x plus 1, x minus 2, and then x uh, minus negative 2. And then from there, I just graph those intercepts. And because they all have a 1 exponent, I should be going through, through, and through. 
And if I look at the original, it's a positive x to the odd. So it's going to have this behavior. So that means it's coming from the bottom, going through, through, and then eventually through the other one. Um, and so then that's how we picked this particular graph. They all seem to have the correct in behavior, but this one was the only one that had the correct intercepts. So, and then here they just ask you what were the actual intercepts and we did find those, they're right here. Now we're gonna repeat the same process, but with a different function for number 33. So the factors of this constant over the factors of this leading coefficient. The factors of 15 are one, three, five, and 15. The factors of four are one, two, and four. So this became a much longer list. One over one is one. One over two is one half. One over four is one fourth. Three over one is three. Three over two is three halves. Three over four is three fourths. I typed it in the computer correctly, but for some reason I wrote a five over there. Then the same with the five and then the same with the 15. Okay, and so that gave me all of this list. Again, all of the positives and all of the negatives and it did take me forever to type this in there. Sorry, <laughs> but when you get to that problem, if your numbers are as big as mine, you're gonna have a long list like this one. So I did plug in all of them, or I intended to plug in all of them, but as I was working, I noticed that this one worked, this one worked, and this one worked but it's an X cubed problem. And since I already found all three, I just needed to stop. There's literally no point in going any further because all the rest of them are not gonna turn out to be zero. So the zeros are negative one, three halves and five halves. And since if I put my function in its factored form, it would be F of X equals X plus one. Um, this is actually gonna be two X minus three and this is gonna be two X minus five. But if you notice, the powers on each one are going to be um, one, one, and one. And then because it was a positive x to the odd at the beginning, it should have this behavior. So if I mark all of those intercepts, negative one, three halves, and five halves, and I come from the bottom, I'm going to have to go through, come back down, go through, go back up, and go through. And so then this is the image here. And the only one that matched that was this one with the right in behavior and the correct intercepts. We're almost getting to the end, no more of those polynomial graphs now. Um, but number 34 says find a polynomial. So you can choose whatever a value you wanna put right here. I always choose one when I'm given a choice. And so then the first zero was four, so it's x minus four is a factor. Negative three i, so it's x plus three i as the factor. And then we know that if we have one imaginary, we automatically have its conjugate. So we also have X minus three I. Always multiply your conjugate factors together first. So one times X minus four is just X minus four. And if I FOIL all of these out, I get all of these terms. These two terms cancel. This I squared is a negative one times the negative nine, which made it a positive nine. Then I FOILed out all of these and combined my like terms. I didn't have any like terms. I just reordered them in order. And I ended up with this as my function and I typed that in and that was correct. For number 35, we were given three, three and one plus I and we automatically have the conjugate one minus I. And since it said the word A polynomial again, I could choose whatever A value I want to and I chose one again. So we have x minus 3, x minus 3, x minus 1 minus i, x minus 1 plus i. And then i 1 times anything is the same thing, so I didn't really write this one. But I foiled out the x minus 3s and I foiled out these imaginary conjugates. And I ended up with x squared minus 6x plus 9 for the first product. And then x squared, ultimately x squared minus 2x plus 2 for the second product. If you need to examine this further, please always take advantage of the fact that you can rewind, pause, <laughs> and do all of that in these videos. You could even slow my voice down because I know I'm talking fast, okay? There's a lot of problems in this unit and in this review, and I want to make sure that I cover all of them in the shortest amount of time so I'm not wasting your time. Um, then I had to actually foil these two trinomials. So after distributing all the x squared, distributing all the negative six, and distributing all the nine, we ended up with all of these guys combined all the like terms, and that is the function that I typed in this box. We have about five more problems left. So 
36, we have a um, this one here. And so we're asked to find the vertical and horizontal asymptotes. So for vertical asymptotes, we're setting our denominator equal to zero. So this equal to zero, you'll have to minus the eight over divide by the five. That's my vertical asymptote, the whole thing. It's a whole equation. Horizontal or slant asymptote, we look at the degree of the numerator, which is one, degree of the denominator, which is one, which is they're the same. When they're the same, you have to take the ratio of the leading coefficient of the numerator over the leading coefficient of the denominator. So the guy with the one had a negative three in front. The guy with the one here had a five in front. So that's this. So the horizontal asymptote is negative three fifths. For number 37, my vertical asymptote, denominator equal to zero. I could not factor this, so I went ahead and used my quadratic formula, but I ended up with imaginary numbers. So that meant that there's no vertical asymptote that I can draw on my graph because it's imaginary. You can't draw imaginary stuff yet. <laughs> You'll learn how to do that in pre-calc. Now, horizontal asymptote and slant asymptote, we're looking at those degrees. So the degree of the numerator is two, the degree of the denominator is two. Again, they're the same, so I have to take the leading coefficient of the numerator over the leading coefficient of the denominator, which is that invisible one right here. So my ratio is just negative three. Since I didn't have a vertical asymptote, I only typed in the one equation, y equals to negative three. Now for 38, we have this function, vertical asymptote, set that denominator equal to zero. But before I can do that, I have to see if I can simplify this. And all of the previous functions, if you go back and you look at those, those could not factor, so I couldn't reduce them. But this does factor. So I factored it, and I noticed that the x minus threes cancel. So I'm only looking at this from now on when I determine my vertical asymptotes and my horizontal asymptotes. So I took my denominator equal to zero. I got x equal to negative three. I did my denominators or my degrees. There's no x's in the numerator, so the degree of the numerator is zero. The degree downstairs, the power is one for x, so that's one. So that means my numerator degree is smaller than my denominator degree, which means my horizontal asymptote is automatically at y equals zero. So these are the two asymptotes that we type into the box. All right, second to last problem. We have this function here, 2x squared plus 1 over x. So we know that the domain is all real numbers except those x values that make the denominator 0. So let's go figure out what's going to make the denominator 0. The denominator is x. So if x equals 0, that's the one number you're going to omit from your, from your domain. So your domain is all real numbers except that x equal to zero. For your x-intercepts, which is the next thing they ask you for, um, you're gonna set the whole fraction equal to zero. So I multiplied both sides by my common denominator. That canceled that zero times anything is zero. I minus one over and then I divided by two. When I took the square root, I ended up getting the square root of a negative, which is imaginary, which means there's no x-intercepts. For the y-intercept, I plug in zero for x, but I got over zero. This fraction is undefined, which means there's no y-intercept. So then for my asymptotes, I take my denominator equal to zero, which was x equal to zero, which is this asymptote right here. And then the degree of the numerator was two, but the degree of the denominator was just one. See, high power of two, high power of one. That means that the top is bigger by exactly one. So I had to do long division. And if I fill in the missing zeros here um, from 2x squared plus 1, and I do my log division, I end up that my slant asymptote is going to occur at just 2x, so y equal to 2x. That's this line here that I tried to draw, but it's kind of crooked. Um, and I didn't have any x-intercepts, and I didn't have any y-intercepts. So I knew I couldn't be over here, because that would mean I would have to touch the x-axis. And I knew I couldn't be over here, because that means I would have to touch the x-axis. So I was pretty sure that the graph was going to be in this section and this section, but I didn't know where exactly. So I just plugged in one and got a y value of three. So I knew it was up there. And then I plugged in negative one and got negative three. And then I knew I couldn't cross these little barriers. So I knew the graph had to go downward like that. And there was only one image that matched my image. And that was this one in the bottom right. OK, finally, last one. And so we have this function here. Again, for domain, the bottom cannot equal zero. So if I add over 36, take the square root of both sides, I get plus or minus six. So the domain is all real numbers except plus or minus six. Okay, those are the only two bad guys that will cause the function to go undefined. 
So for x intercepts, you set the whole fraction equal to zero. If I multiply both sides by my common denominator, right? Here it'll cancel zero times anything is still zero. And then if I cube root both sides, I get this equation. And then the cube root of zero is just zero. So I get the x-intercept when x equals zero when the y value is zero. Similarly, for y-intercept, you plug in zero for x. That computes out to just zero over negative 36, which is zero. So it's the same point, OK? For my vertical and hot slant asymptotes, I'm going to set my denominator equal to zero for my vertical asymptote, which I've already done, and I got plus or minus six. So there should be vertical asymptotes, one at negative six and one at positive six. And I think right now with that information, you're down to these two graphs because these are the wrong intercepts on the other two graphs, okay? So we've got that and notice I did separate them one and then the other when I type them in. Now for the slant or horizontal, a slant or horizontal asymptote, the degree of the numerator was three and the degree of the denominator was two which means the degree of the numerator was bigger than the denominator by one. So I had to do long division and X cubed by itself is missing a lot of terms. So I don't have any X squared, I don't have any X's and I don't have any constants. So in order for me to do this, I did X cubed over X, which gave me X squared. That is what, or no, I'm sorry, X over X squared gave me X. So that's where this came from. And then X times this and X times this gave me X cubed minus 36 X. I subtracted, so I changed the signs which gave me positive 36 X. But when I go to reduce this, this doesn't reduce. I still end up with X's in a fraction. And so I don't have anything else. This is like my remainder, okay? But for the slant asymptote, we always ignore the remainder. So it's just Y equals whatever the quotient is. In this case, it's Y equals to X. So um, if you notice, I'm down between these two graphs because they have the correct vertical asymptotes. And notice that my line has a positive X, which means my slope of my slant asymptote should be positive. And if you're looking at this graph, this has a negative slope. It's declining from left to right. Whereas this one has a positive slope because it's inclining from left to right. And so this is the only graph that has my matching asymptotes, okay? Um, but that is the end. Again, I apologize for having to rush through it. I'm trying to save your time. You can pause and see the explanations there. You can also text me um, questions. If I went over something and you didn't quite understand it, um, please, please, please reach out to me. That's what I'm here for. Um, but other than that, you guys have a great day.